me get my almond buttercup. Let me get my, what's this called? <laughs> a whisper. Gold. Oh my god, this smells so good. They're delicious. So, we are doing a mini snack swap right now. Can you guys hear the lovely crinkling? <laughs> Hi, I'm Emily. <laughs> Hi, I'm Neve. And welcome to episode 17 of Rowan and Pine. 17! Oh my goodness. I know. We're trucking. Isn't that nuts? We're trucking. I didn't think we'd make it, make it to 10. Yeah, <laughs> truly. <laughs> I was like, yeah, we'll do like a few. Yeah. Yeah, we can, We like started and it was like, it'll be a fun like little project. And yeah. we just keep doing it because it's fun and we enjoy it. Yeah. Even if it's like four people listening, we're probably still going to keep doing it as long as we can. Yeah. Hello to the four of you. Uh, but Hi, Neve, all four of you. <laughs> Neve was just saying that we're doing a mini snack swap. We've been talking about this for a month ish. <laughs> like three episodes now. <laughs> this is the third episode that we're talking about. It. There'll be just like snacks, okay? Yeah. And we did the live where I ate a couple of the snacks that you sent me, but you didn't have the ones that I sent. But you just got them, so now you're gonna try one. Yeah. They finally arrived. I am trying Justin's dark chocolate almond butter cups that look like Reese's peanut butter cups, which I also love. So these are really good though. I have too. high hopes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh my god. Okay. You, I'm taking a bite. I'm taking a bite. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh my god. They're very good. <laughs> kind of hate that you've done this to me and I can't get them here. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, they're so good. I'll start sending. Well, like, we should do, like, uh, every six months we, like, send each other a package. A care package. I would be dying for that. So would I. Because... I'm sorry to all uh, the people who hate the mouth sounds, but... <laughs> she just likes to torture people. Yeah. Um, I just think you should grow up. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Emily is going to try. What are you trying? Whisper Gold. Oh, yes. So, slight bit of background on Whisper Gold. So, ordinary whispers are just milk chocolate. Then, sometime in like, when I was a kid anyway, they brought out Whisper Gold which had a little layer of caramel in them. So good. And uh, they got rid of them. Oh, no. And there was such a public outcry that there was an online petition to bring them back. So what you're holding now is the result of democracy. <laughs> <laughs> People went... And, and I hope you appreciate all of our efforts. People went and stormed <laughs> the chocolate factory. Yeah, Irish people, we don't protest very much. Uh, we only protest the one time they tried to make us pay for our own water and for a wisp of gold. So. <laughs> bottoms <laughs> Takes up. Takes a lot. Bottoms up. Just... Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, the bubbly chocolate. I was going to say, I thought it was like similar to a Milky Way with like the, I don't even know what's in a Milky Way, but it's like caramel and then it's like a fluffy chocolate it's like a whipped yeah yeah it's like nougat or something yeah I don't know. is it even nougat <laughs> please title the episode do you pronounce the t in nougat <laughs> please title the episode is it even nougat <laughs> <laughs> that's really good though i approve when i was a kid i used to be really really messy and so there's another one made by nestle called arrow i don't know if you guys have those there i don't think so and um it's like really, really fun to let it melt on your tongue because it feels like there's little like tingles. Oh, weird. And like the whole arrow, arrow thing is, have you felt the bubbles melt? <laughs> so um, arrow and Wispa are like competitors. And yeah, when I was a kid, I used to just be really, really messy and just have like melted chocolate all over my mouth <laughs> because melted chocolate is superior and we will hear nothing different. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, I remember I had an ally in this fight, but I couldn't remember who it was. It was me. It was you. Of course it was yes. you. There was a an in-depth discussion about chocolate being put in the freezer. And Emily and I are staunch anti-freezer people. Yes. Why would you make chocolate harder to eat? Right. Why? It is so much better when it just melts in your mouth and is delicious. I would literally rather keep chocolate in my armpits than put it in the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> I have kept chocolate in my armpits. <laughs> I've definitely sat on it before to make it like 
a little bit yeah you have to like get it to like a perfect melting point and then and then eat it yeah not so melty that it's like mostly on your hands or you have to lick it off the paper not that bad it just has to be but when it's like bendy yeah like body temperature maybe a little bit less than that body temperature i like that i like the specificity of body temperature chocolate (laughs) we're not going celsius (laughs) or fahrenheit here we're going body temperature (laughs) yes body temperature it's universal it is So on that note, (laughs) what are we talking about today? Well, this episode, for once in our entire career, I have said what the next episode might be about at the end of one episode and then actually done that exact subject for the next episode. (laughs) Karma! (laughs) Ah! (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Everyone's having a moment here with the caramel. (laughs) Everything's fine. So episode 17 will be about cats. Yay! We've had an episode on frogs, which uh, we know a lot of people really liked. Mm -hmm. And today's episode on cats is something that I was sort of thinking, like, maybe I should just, like, pick an animal. And I was also thinking of maybe horses, but kind of covered horses a little bit in our sound episode. So um, we're going to talk about cats. We're going to talk about, like, what cats have meant to people uh, throughout history and a couple of associations that they have with deities around the world. So, And we know that we have a lot of cat-loving listeners. We do. If you don't love cats, I'm sorry. Just shut the podcast off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just turn it off. <laughs> I firmly believe that people who don't like cats have just never had one because if you don't like cats and you treat a cat moderately well to the point where it tolerates you, you will like them. Right. Because they're very interesting yeah. and also probably give you toxoplasmosis. Um, <laughs> no, it's a price we pay. Oh my God. What about the cats that we know and love are, as we call, it's a quote unquote domestic cats, but are any cats really domesticated? They would all leave if they could. Anyway. I think my cat is an exception. Yeah, she does sound like she is in her princess era. She is <laughs> luxuriating. Yes. <laughs> her life consists of pillows and uh, long lazy Sunday mornings uh, but every morning and she's who we aspire aspire to be yeah she loves the um, addition of the pregnancy pillow in bed because <laughs> it's like a it's like a big um, like U shape like a giant one and so she loves to sleep in like the the center of it where she's like surrounded by pillow <laughs> she's like how nice of you to get me this pillow <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> Because then when, like, I'm sleeping on it at night, she tries to, like, climb in there. I'm like, no, lady, this is mine. My back She's hurts. Like, Emily, you're on my pillow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, are you pregnant? <laughs> so it's thought that the cats we share our homes with are descendants of one member of the Philidae family that existed between 10 and 12 million years ago in Asia. This, like, original, like, we're going to call it mother cat, uh, would have shared the same features as the cats that we know and love today. Since then, and through migration around the world, they have evolved into 37 different species within the Felidae family, which can also be split into three groups. So there's the Panthera cats. So those are the ones that roar, like your big cats, lions, tigers, and leopards. Big cats. Achaeonyx or Achaeonyx. This defines cats that don't have sheaths for guarding their claws, but there's only one cat existing today that has that classification, and that's the cheetah. I was going to say what I couldn't think of any off the top of my head. I'm not like a pro biologist, but. (laughs) Yeah, so their claws are like always out, kind of like dogs. The felis, which is all other small cats, like a house cat. I also think it's interesting. I think cheetahs do purr, but I don't think lions do. Like lions and tigers. Weird. And obviously small cats purr as well. Yes. (laughs) So the domestic cat, its Latin name is the felis catus. (laughs) Perfect. It's the most recently evolved of all the species. According to one old legend, when God created the earth, he created every creature except for cats. But on Noah's Ark, once the Ark was afloat in the water and it became infested with rats, Noah prayed for a miracle and a pair of cats sprang to life from the mouths of the lion and lioness. They set to work and quickly dispatched all of the rats except for the the original two rats. And as their reward, when the boat reached dry land, the cats walked at the head of the great procession of Noah's animals, which is why the legend concludes all cats are so proud to this very day. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, that's where they get their sense of importance from. Yeah, that's why they feel like they're the center of the universe. (laughs) And they are. Uh, Some of the earliest images of felines are found on cave walls. Uh, They're carved out of stone. Wild cats are companions and guardians to 
a lot of the great goddesses that we will get into later. They're usually flanking a mother goddess figure, usually present at any birth scenes that uh, the goddesses are depicted in and show up in mythology all around the world. We're going to take a little trip around the world <laughs> and see where these little kitties have shown up throughout the years. So fasten your seatbelts, <laughs> keep all of your limbs inside of the car at all times. Pick up your cat carriers, pack your <laughs> harnesses. I would love to harness train in my cats, but I just don't have the dedication to keep doing it because they hate it so much. Yeah. I really wish that. Have you seen the videos? I've only seen a couple of them, but people have like a little like hammock type thing attached yes. to the windows in their car and the cat mm -hmm. just chills in that while they go on a road trip. Yes. I wish I could do that with my cat. That looks so cool. It would be so nice to just be able to bring her with instead of finding a cat sitter every time. <laughs> Yeah, because like you always have to weigh up like the amount of stress that they'll be under because you're like, they'll be stressed if I leave, but it would be more stressed if I brought them with me. Yeah. And like the best case scenario is just leaving them in their own environment and having someone that they kind of recognize come check on them. <laughs> but yeah, it still sucks. Right. But um, my friend Ruth was saying she was looking after, she was feeding my cats when we went on like our little mini moon after the wedding. Yeah. And she said she realized right as like she was pulling up to my house that I had not shown her where the cat food is. Oh my goodness. As soon as they realized she was probably there to feed them, they like herded her towards <laughs> the kitchen and sat in front of their cupboard. <laughs> They're like, it's in there. Get it out now. Of course they did. They're like, I'll lead the way. <laughs> yeah. Do you know where it is? It's like the only reason we haven't got in there is because none of us have opposable thumbs. Yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> so researchers consider the Middle East the place where people first domesticated cats. First evidence of a blotched or tabby coat pattern cat which commonly appears in domesticated cats, appeared in Turkey during the 14th century. Fossil records from early human settlements show the coexistence of wild cats and humans, but recent evidence has shown that it wasn't until around 10,000 years ago that the way we viewed cats began to change with the finding of a cat in Cyprus who had been buried with their owner. Wow. Which I kind of hope the cat was dead when that was buried. Oh, um, yeah. It was pretty sad. Yeah. It's thought that the reason why these cats like sort of started to become ingratiated with humans was because it was the beginning of a lot of farming communities. With farms, you have mice and other rodents. Um, so the cats were pest control. Pest control. <laughs> the Greek playwright Aristophanes frequently featured cats in his work for comic effect. And he coined the phrase, the cat did it, which was like a citing blame. It was like <laughs> a, a frequent thing in his in his works. And among ancient civilizations, the cat was probably least popular among the Greeks, owing to its association in certain myths with the god of, goddess of death, darkness and witches, Hecate, who we have mentioned on this podcast before. I love Hecate. Yeah, and now I'm saying her name right because I think I said Hecate the first time I, I said it on this podcast. <laughs> Hecate. <laughs> we couldn't really talk about cats and mythology without mentioning ancient Egypt, which is probably the largest part of my notes here because there's just so much on it. Yeah, the Egyptians love their cats. Yeah, they do. So the first evidence of the domesticated cat uh, that genus, the Felis catus, was found in ancient Egypt. They were tasked with protecting grain stores and therefore were seen as guardians against famine. And they also represented eternity because of the way they're able to curl up into a perfect little circle. Aww. Like an Ouroboros? I was going to say. I have always heard it Ouroboros. Is it Ouroboros? Yeah, I was going to say. But... I don't think I'm saying that right. So to curl up into a perfect little circle like an Ouroboros. According to another Greek historian, Herodotus, enormous temple complex was built in honour of the Egyptian cat god Bast in the centre of her city, Bubastis. He related that Egyptians cared so much for their cats that they placed their safety above human life and property. When a house caught fire, Egyptians would concern themselves more with rescuing the cats than with anything else, often running back into a burning building or forming a perimeter around the flames to keep cats away at a safe distance. <laughs> Sounds accurate. <laughs> Sounds like something I would do. Yeah, I was going to say, that's kind of adorable. Yeah. <laughs> when a cat died, all of the inhabitants of the house shaved their eyebrows as a sign of deep mourning. Cats which have died are taken to Bubastis, the city that we mentioned before, where they are embalmed and buried in sacred receptacles. So when a cat dies, they shave their eyebrows? Yeah, they shave their eyebrows off and the period of mourning was considered complete when everybody's eyebrows had grown back. That's such an interesting uh, practice, yeah. ritual. <laughs> but I'm thinking as well, like, I, like, obviously I'm just taking this from 
like films, but you often see like Egyptian nobility would always have their eyebrows shaved off and like drawn back on. Okay, yeah. Like a lot of the time. I always thought that was just a cosmetic thing, but who knows, maybe they were in mourning for a cat. (laughs) Constantly. (laughs) In the first century, Greek historian Diodorus, or Diodorus, reported the fate of a hapless Roman who had accidentally caused the death of a cat. He wrote, The populace crowded to the house of the Roman who had committed the murder, and neither the efforts of the magistrates sent by the king to protect him, nor the universal fear inspired by the might of Rome could avail to save the man's life, though what he had done was admitted to be accidental. This is not an incident from which I report from hearsay, but something I saw for myself during my sojourn in Egypt. So literally a mob came to this man's house and killed him. That's intense. (laughs) (laughs) Do you want to take a guess what the ancient Egyptian word for cat is? I don't know. Mal. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Isn't that adorable? It's so perfect. (laughs) Uh, So it's noted that that is both an imitation of cat speech and a mother syllable. Uh, You know, the way babies usually say words begin with M when they're around their mothers so much. And Bast, the cat mother, was a goddess whose cult began in the delta city of Bubastis and eventually covered all of Egypt with the rise of the 22nd dynasty. Unlike the fierce lion-headed Sekhmet from an earlier Egyptian myth, Bast embodied the benevolent aspects of cats, fertility, sexuality, love, and life-giving heat. They do love some life-giving heat. I was going to say, life-giving heat. (laughs) Even to the point where you're like, you're strangling me, get away from my neck. (laughs) And they're just like, oh, it's so cold. I'm going to be like a, a little scarf. In a side note, my unborn child also really likes this Wispa candy bar. Oh, does she? All of a sudden, she she's dance? like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> yeah. She's like, this is good. Yeah. She's like, give me more, more chocolate. Of this, Mom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. More chocolate. <laughs> Bast was depicted as the daughter of Ra and Isis. Additionally, the cat's eyes with their reflective nature and their own waxing and waning pupil, so the little slits that their pupils go into made them an associate of Ra as well as the moon goddesses. This is a very important association for the male cat because every night Ra, in the form of a cat, would journey to the underworld and fight the snake demon Apophis to ensure his return as the sun god. Cool. Yeah, that sounds a bit exhausting for Ra there. Like, yeah, it really does. He just has to, he has to go there every night and have a fight. Every single night. <laughs> <laughs> does that mean in winter the fights last longer? It's like three extra rounds or something? <laughs> He's like, come on, man. It's Saturday. I'm tired. Although if you're doing it every day, it's like there's no weekend. There's no there's no break. I also don't know why. Why is Apophis uh, agreeing to this? Because he's losing every single night. (laughs) Have you not learned your lesson? (laughs) He's like, no, I've got to fight him again. (laughs) Yeah, it's like the I feel like I keep referencing the veterinary show that we keep watching. But like so many dogs come in to the clinic with porcupine quills in their faces Mm. and like this one dog came in on like a monday and then was there on tuesday again with porcupine quills in its face and they were like they never learn you would think that they would see it and they would be like oh scary stay back but instead they're like that thing hurt me i'm gonna get it (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's like just out for pure revenge yeah (laughs) And then they get hurt again because they can't fight with a porcupine. They're always going to lose. It's like my cousin's dog when we were growing up, Jojo. Jojo, I don't know. I lost count of the amount of times that she fought with badgers. And she was like a Jack Russell Terrier. Badgers are way bigger than her. Yeah. (laughs) She never learned. No. I guess like if you're, if dogs have the ability to feel pride, their pride's probably wouldn't. (laughs) (laughs) Like, no, like they just caught me on the hop. Like, I'm going to get it next time. (laughs) Whereas, like, cats are so weird because they'll, like, remember some things and not others. Yeah. They'll remember exactly what the sound of, like, their treat packet is like after one time opening them. Yeah. And then you're trying to teach them a trick and they're just, like, looking at you blankly like, no. Yeah, like, my cat, she knows where, like, the drawer where her treats are. So if I open Mm -hmm. it for any reason at all, she's like, hi, (laughs) treats for me? I'm like, no, stupid. I'm looking for my glasses. No. (laughs) We have a chair in our uh, kitchen. That we just like pulled in out of the, the living room just to get it out of the way. And you refers to it as the throne of moan because they just get up and just go. Mah! Oh, no. It's right beside their food press. Ugh. <laughs> Sounds like you need to move the chair again. <laughs> yeah. Or at least put something uncomfortable on it. But 
They, like, they fought over that chair. Ripley mm-hmm. loves sleeping on it because she will never miss an opportunity to get fed, basically. Yeah. She's like, if I sleep right next to the food press, I'm never going to sleep through a meal. Even though she oh, has never goodness. done that in her entire life. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Cats are so goofy. Yeah, she's never... We joked that, like, she would never... She's never thrown up a meal because she literally just would not waste that much food because <laughs> she, you can't fill her. <laughs> The one time she's ever been full was her very first Christmas. And I don't know, as I saying it to you, we were like giving her like leftover ham and turkey. Oh my goodness. And it got to the point where like I'd put enough out for her in pounds and she ate the entire thing. And of then course. she was so full she couldn't even jump on my lap. Oh my goodness. <laughs> she was just like giving these little aborted like. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, help me. I'm yeah. Fat. <laughs> Yeah, and then I turned, like, she was lying down and she was on her side and she looked like a little letter B because her belly was so distended. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> You're like, next Christmas. Yeah. I'm not doing this. Yeah, but she doesn't learn. Like, if she if she sees us coming, like, in the door with some tinfoil, she's like, oh, for me? Mine. <laughs> <laughs> so for Bass, there were festivals twice a year. They were described as carnivals of music, dancing, wine drinking, love making, and religious ecstasy. One account recorded 700,000 attendees at her city in the 5th century, which is fucking insane. Like, there were probably only about 2 million people there <laughs> in the <Yeah>. whole country. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, the greatest example of Egyptian devotion to cats, however, comes from the Battle of Pelusium, which was uh, the year 525 BC in which Cambyses II of Persia defeated the forces of the Egyptian pharaoh conquer Egypt. Knowing of the Egyptians' love for cats, Cambyses had his men round up various animals, cats chiefly above them, and drive the animals before their invading forces towards the fortified city of Pelusium on the Nile. The Persian soldiers painted images of cats on their shields and may have held cats in their arms as they marched behind the wall of animals. The Egyptians, reluctant to defend themselves for fear of harming the cats, and perhaps incurring the death penalty should they kill one, were demoralised at seeing the image of Bastet, Bast or Bastet, on the enemy's shields. They surrendered the city and let Egypt fall to the Persians. Okay, what I picked up from that <laughs> was, <laughs> I'm not like super into the death penalty, but if you kill an animal cruelly... We yeah. should bring that back for them. <laughs> <laughs> like those yeah. idiots who like light a cat on fire and like put it in a cage and stuff like that on the internet. If there's proof mm-hmm. that you did something, goodbye. We yeah. don't need your kind. There's a like a premiership football player who there are there's a video of him like I'm pretty sure he has a Siamese cat, which is like one of the other things is like if you're gonna pay that much fucking money for an animal, yeah. treat it well at least. Um, but he's like throwing it around and kicking it. Oh my god. Somebody had like uh, leaked this footage of him and he has just, I think he was, there was talk of him like being charged with animal cruelty, but like, you know, like the English football chants, the opposing side are constantly like just giving him shit about it. Like, where's your cat? Where's your cat? (laughs) Yeah. I hope he never lives that down. I hope it follows him for the rest of his life. Same. It's what he deserves. Yeah. <laughs> the historian Polly Anus writes that after the surrender, Cambyses rode in triumph through the city and hurled cats into the faces of the <laughs> defeated Egyptians in scorn. I know. I, I laughed at that earlier. It's like, oh, all oh, things. It's like, aha. Psh. I don't like some claws to the face. But what was really interesting that the Persians actually revered cats themselves. A Persian tale claimed that the cat was created magically. The great Persian hero Rustam out on campaign one night, saved a magician from a band of thieves. Rustam offered the older man the hospitality of his tent and, as they sat outside under the stars, enjoying the warmth of a fire, the magician asked Rustam what he wished for a gift in repayment for saving the man's life. Rustam told him that there was nothing he desired since he had everything he could want. Except for a cat. (laughs) Before him, in the warmth and comfort of the fire, the scent of the smoke and the beauty of the stars overhead. The magician then took a handful of smoke, added flame, and brought down two of the brightest stars, kneading them together in his hands and glowing on them. When he opened his hands towards Rustam, the warrior saw a small, smoky grey kitten with eyes bright as the stars and a tiny tongue which darted like the tip of a flame. In this way, the Persian cat came to be created as a token of gratitude. Ah, That is adorable. So why are you guys is. throwing cats at Egyptians? How do we go from that to there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 
It, we're just taken on a ride, I feel like. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's such a beautiful story. And I really like thinking that cats were like made by magic. Because even, even with the story um, with Moses, um, I feel like the Christian population wouldn't want to call it magic. <laughs> mm-hmm. But let's, I'm going to call it like I see it. It's magic. Yeah, it is magic. Oh, oh, we need cats? We'll just make some? Yeah, they couldn't possibly be like an intentional thing. They're just like made some from like from the mouths of lions, partly. <laughs> just made them appear. Sounds like magic. <laughs> Have you heard this before about tabbies and the little M that's on their forehead? Have I heard what? So there was a legend about the Prophet Muhammad that he was very fond of cats. And if you look at a tabby, the M design on their forehead was made when Muhammad blessed his favorite cat. By placing his hand on its head. Aww, that's cute. This cat was called Meuza, and he also features in another famous story in which Muhammad called to prayer, found the cat asleep on his arm. Rather than disturb the cat, Muhammad cut the sleeve from his robe and left Meuza to sleep. The status of the cat, therefore, was further enhanced by its association with the figure of divinity. I love that uh, that makes it sound like Muhammad is just like every cat owner. Like, I find myself standing <laughs> yesterday because my cat was on my office chair and I was standing typing for work and I'm like, what am I doing? I could just move him. Seriously. <laughs> or like when you're sleeping and you're like, they're so comfortable, yeah. but I'm not. Yeah. So Yeah, and they can be they can get comfortable on anything. Like it takes absolutely nothing for them to get comfortable. So I don't know why we're so reluctant to move them. Yeah, like all they're gonna do is be like, Oh man, <laughs> and then they're gonna find somewhere yeah. else. <laughs> And they will fall back asleep within yeah, a minute. Exactly. <laughs> I just had to look up tabby cats because I was like trying to picture the M. I know they had like stripes on yeah. their head, but I was like, what exactly does yeah, it look like? They do have like a little, yes. little M. Not a, not all yeah. of them, but yeah. So the ancient Romans also had some reverence for cats. Uh, cats were seen as a symbol of liberty and an appreciation for the animal as a hunter was not as great. That was mainly because there was a Roman p- practice of keeping domesticated weasels for pest control. <laughs> I would also yeah. do that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing. Weasels are so cool. <laughs> well, anything that's like that, like those, what do they call them? Like, Ferret? no, noodle cats. They call them oh. weasels and ferrets and minks. Like, they all just look like elongated cats, <laughs> noodle cats. That's so, yeah, they're very like squiggly and jumpy yeah. and they're all over the place. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to figure out what the... You like the scientific term for like that grouping of animals. Yeah, there is definitely. I think they're like genetically similar to cats. I feel like there there's some relation there. Or maybe am I just thinking of hyenas? One of those things that like hyenas look like dogs, but they're actually more genetically similar to cats. Yeah, it's the same with foxes. Yeah. I didn't know that about hyenas. But like, you know, like weasels and badgers and wolverines, like they're all in the same anyway this is not a science podcast <laughs> i was gonna say you can look it up if you if you want to while i'm talking yeah i'm i'm going to i figured it out what they're part of the mustelid mustelid uh genus oh so that's a, a ferret a stoat a weasel european badger a martin i don't know what that is oh yeah we have little pine martins they kind of look like uh little kind of shorter weasels yeah, they look like a little like cat like mm-hmm. with like rounded ears. Yeah. But also otters. Yay. Yay for otters. No wonder we love all the other ones. Yeah. Just to finish off about cats in ancient Rome, because they didn't really domesticate them because they had their little weasel friends. That was why the Romans regarded the cats as a symbol of independence and not as a creature of utility. So they're like, we respect you, but we know we can't control you. So we know we yeah. started it. It's like, we, we we know what you're about. <laughs> they ruined cats forever. Made them feel like they're important yep. or something. <laughs> so the other culture that I feel gets most closely associated with cats is the Japanese. In Japan, the famous image of the beckoning cat, which is Maneki Niko. If I'm saying that right? Yeah. Cat with, with little... one raised paw. Yeah. That represents the goddess of mercy. So the legend behind that goes that there was a cat sitting outside the temple of Gotokuji and she raised her paw in acknowledgement of the emperor who was passing by. And because the emperor thought that the cat was really cute and went over to it, moments later, there was a flash of lightning exactly where he had been standing. So he felt that the cat saved his life. Uh, So the cat was accorded great honors. Yeah. (laughs) 
like every culture is doing a lot to make cats <laughs> feel really important. <laughs> They're assigning so much like agency to the cats, like the cat the cats are doing all of this. <laughs> <laughs> on yeah. purpose when all of my knowledge of cats is like it's all self-serving he was probably like right. <laughs> the cat was probably like hey kind of hungry <laughs> just raising its little paw <laughs> this isn't balto <laughs> so since then the beckoning cat image is thought to bring good luck when given as a gift and remains a very popular present in japan and the cat was regularly considered a guardian of the home and was thought to be a special protector of valuable books because of all of these honors that they are bestowed, they're housed in private pagodas in Japan and were considered to be so valuable that by the 10th century, only no nobility could afford to own one. Wow. Which is true now with Maine Coons. <laughs> or the, oh, what's the other one? They're like tall and skinny and stripy. The Bengal. Uh, Bengals, yeah. Yeah. They're gorgeous. They're so um, vocal. Yeah. People are always like posting videos of like, oh, me coming home to my bangle. And it's just like, Mah! yeah, they're super cute, but they seem like shitheads. <laughs> yeah, they seem like they're a lot. They're way too smart as well. Yeah. Like you'll see them like opening like doors and stuff like that. Not in my just, house. Like, they're like a freaking German shepherd of cats, like <laughs> way too clever. I need a cat who's moderately dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You would like Ripley. She is dumb as a post. <laughs> I love her. I already yeah. love her. <laughs> it's why, like, she, yeah, she's she's so pretty, but she's so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> With her sad eyes. <laughs> yeah, her little vac vacant expression. Oh, <laughs> love her. I want to. I just want to hold her. <laughs> so switching over to Europe, we know that for a long time, cats were associated with the dark forces and with witchcraft. Ooh. The connection of cats with witchcraft includes fortune-telling rituals, divination by killing cats in Scotland, mm. which, Scotland, you were doing well last episode, and now I'm kind of mad at you. Scotland actually had, there was like Scotland and Germany had like the most witch trials. Like, I know Salem usually gets the, gets all of the attention, but yeah. um, Germany and Scotland, they had like major like witch persecution movement. Leave it to the US to be like, no, ours was the best, even if it's <laughs> terrible. On the divination aspect, when a cat washed its face, rain was supposed to follow, which I'm sorry, in Scotland, rain is always going to follow. If it's anything like where I live, which is on the same like meridian, like we get rain once a day. <laughs> You're kind of reaching there. <laughs> in Ireland, growing up, a lot of people would have like been a bit wary of cats. Cats were just seen as like pest control. You only let them live around your like farm if they were, you know, doing good work or, you know, keeping mice and rats away and all of that. And I know a lot of people that would like really, really hate cats and scare them away if they were hanging around their house. Yeah. Um, which is like so such an old fashioned way of uh, of looking at them. We just watched a documentary about cats. I think it might have been called like All About Cats. Okay. But um, it was talking about how I think it was a winery and I don't remember. It might have been in England, but it could have been in Ireland. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> it's fine. I do not remember specifics. But yeah, they had, uh, I believe it was a winery and they ended up getting cats and now they have just like bar cats that like hang out at the bar and like customers like will pet them while they're like drinking their wine because they had so many mice. Oh my gosh. And then like obviously mice droppings and stuff like that is like really bad and could like contaminate the wine. So they just have these cats that go around and kill the mice and chill at the bar. <laughs> I would I would pay extra if I could go somewhere and drink wine and pet a cat. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. Like Cat cafes are great, but like if you make them alcoholic, even better. I am there. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> there was actually an old Irish expression relating to cats, um, and it was God bless all here except the cat. Aww. Which is a bit freaking mean if you ask me. Rude. In Celtic mythology, cats do show up. They're sort of wild cats and monstrous cats, and they're usually like the villains. There are a few important mythological sites. So there's a cave in County Roscommon, which is not too far from me. It's believed to be an opening to the other world, like a portal to hell and it's also believed to be the birthplace of the morrigan it's our girl so see a cat's with her <laughs> the place is called uvna gat uh, which means the cave of the cats the cave of the cats is one of the most famous locations in rathcroen which is the area in roscommon and it's part of a network of underground caves the name uvna gat was 
believed to refer to the magical wildcats featured in the tale of Riku's feast that emerged from the cave to attack the Ulster warriors before being tamed by like one of our folk heroes, Ku Cullen. And there's a legend of another woman who was told to have killed a monster cat in this cave and it turned this woman into a great warrior. And that's why it's called Cave of the Cats. When I was looking up, um, I'll send you this picture to put up on our Instagram. There was somebody wrote a blog post about them visiting Uvnagat. Thought they heard that there is a cat who guards the entrance. Okay. And they managed to managed to get a picture of it. And Aww. it's this big, big, massive, black, fluffy cat with a really mean expression. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll send the picture of you. That's amazing. <laughs> it's a picture to you, yeah. And then in Scotland, in the black wood of Chesthill, a tall megalith called Clock Tarum Nan Cat, the stone of the devil cat, was said to be where cats all gathered to celebrate on Halloween. That's a party <laughs> I would like to go to. Yeah, that sounds like great fun. <laughs> <laughs> So that's our little trip around the world. One last question that we uh, that I wanted to answer on this is when did cats actually become domesticated? And this is from the Blue Cross. What's the Blue Cross Society? So, so you know the way we have the Red Cross for like medical attention for humans? Yes. The Blue Cross is for animals. Oh, that's yeah. nice. And they literally have on their website, cats are not considered domesticated. <laughs> what <laughs> yeah it would be more accurate to say the cats are tame <laughs> interesting unlike dogs cats have kept their wild instincts and their behavior is still very similar to that of their ancestors they can still survive without us and they are naturally solitary animals so why do they stay with us there is a popular theory that the African wildcat originally found in ancient Egypt began to populate the rest of the world because it was more sociable and tamer than the previous species and this appealed to humans allowing both humans and cats to create a different type of bond. While this is just a theory, one thing is clear, that cats do show affection towards humans and actively choose to come back to us after being let out of the house. Yeah. They do like us sometimes. <laughs> like I said, my cat is very... She's like not the typical cat at all. She's like yeah. obsessed with people and loves everybody and wants to be around them all the time. Yeah. <laughs> she got out one time and... It was really weird because she like, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but she like ran out the door and then we're both like, my cat's name is Sochi. We're both like, Sochi, Sochi, come back. And she was looking at the both of us just like, who the hell are you? And we're like, we're very confused because we're like, D like what's going on? <laughs> yeah. Like she, she didn't recognize you out of context. Yeah, it was so weird. And then she ran Aww. off and hopped a couple fences and I didn't think I was ever going to see her again. No. But I think she realized that she doesn't like life on the outside because <laughs> <laughs> it was probably six hours later. It was nighttime and I went out into our backyard and I was like, I'm just going to call for her like a couple more times and see if I hear anything. Mm -hmm. And I did. And she was on the other side of our neighbor's fence. And I'm like, Sochi. And then I hear, yeah. And I see like Aww. these sad little eyes looking at me because it was raining and cold. She's <laughs> like, I don't like it out here. I wanted to see what it was like and it's not good. Yeah. And then we got her home and she was all muddy and covered in burrs. And I was just like, you're... No. She went right to her food, of course. <laughs> of course. I was, stressed. I was starving out there. <laughs> They're, they're so funny, like, you and I often have this conversation of, like, which of our cats would actually come back to us if they got out. Yeah. We think Ripley would forget we exist and she would get into the first <laughs> first car that, like, stopped <laughs> for her. She'd be like, oh, they kind of smell like bacon, I guess, and she'd just leave. We think Pounce, Pounce is, like, fully, like, Stockholm syndromed, so, like, he oh, no. just loves us. Like, he, he like, I think he kind of loves me too much. <laughs> and it's just like... I don't want to cuddle you all the time. You're, You're very like, cuddly, but <laughs> why are you so obsessed with me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he really is. Whereas um, Balor, he's still quite young to tell, but I think he freaks out even when the front door is open. So I don't think there's any danger of him running <laughs> off right now. Pounce is very curious about outside. He's made it as far as we usually like park our car at the back of the um, apartment building. He is. He kept like trying to get out when I was like at the clothesline. Yeah. And he would like come out and then like when he'd see me coming back, he'd like run back into the apartment. Um, but one time he obviously got out too far because our door was had this weird thing where you couldn't like you couldn't unlock it properly. So you had to like put it on a latch. So he kept like coming out. But this time he got out and I didn't realize and he was under the car. Oh, no. And 
like it was it was good like 45 minutes before I noticed that he was he wasn't there um so I went out and I was like I have a feeling he's like under the car and of course Ewan's like freaking out and um so I went down to my belly and he was like under the car and I could just see the, like the big massive like glowing eyes <laughs> um and he was like as small as possible and like Zochi I feel like he couldn't recognize me yeah. Like he was just so scared he didn't know who I was and it was only like I was literally like under the car like I was I couldn't even breathe like because our car is pretty low to the ground. Oh my goodness. Like just like under and I was like you might have to pull me out by the ankles here and I eventually <laughs> like got a hand like close enough to him that he could like smell me and then okay. like he started shimmying like towards me but I'm just like who else would it be trying to get you? <laughs> like, All of a sudden he's like dumbass. wait you <laughs> smell like my house. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're such little jackasses. Yeah, they're special. They always say like if your if your cat gets out like a good a good way of I only read this like a year ago. A good way of taming them back is put some of their own used litter outside. Interesting. Because they'll they'll smell their own scent markings. Yeah. Um. So it'll help them like find their way back home, and they'll be able to smell it from pretty far away. Yeah, I was seeing a lot of like put their food outside, and I'm like, okay, but that's not only just gonna attract my cat. <laughs> Yeah. It's going to bring in the <laughs> opossums and the raccoons and other yeah. cats. <laughs> Here, like, if you put dry food outside, all the crows love it. Like, you can see them, like, dive bombing because we have oh, some yeah. little cats out the back. And, like, if we have some dry food, like, I'll, I'll throw it out to them, especially in the really, really cold months. Yeah. Um. But, yeah, you just see crows, like, diving for it. And I'm like, that's not for you. It's for the cats. <laughs> you can give them shelled peanuts. They like those. Oh, really? Yeah. It's good to but, know. Because everybody yeah. I know feeds them bread and I don't think you're supposed to feed them that no they're not supposed to eat bread <laughs> yeah <laughs> also on things you're not supposed to do keep your cats inside your house do not let them out into the wild they should not be mm -hmm. outside they're ruining everything Emily shared an article the last day that they're like decimating bird populations yeah and just like the kind of like the natural cycle of everything the ecosystem just, outside yeah would you like your natural habitat to stay how it is yeah keep your cat in the house <laughs> there's also all of the diseases they can pick up from wild cats right or they can get in yeah they can get in fights with other cats and all that kind of stuff so uh it's yeah. good for you it's good for the environment it's good for everybody involved just keep your cats inside the Mic end drop. <laughs> thank you for coming to our ted talk yes and thank you for listening to our podcast yeah, thank you for being here with us for 17 episodes so far. We will have another one for you in two weeks' time. Emily is still planning for it at the moment. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you what it's about because I don't think you've decided yet. <laughs> I have not decided, but I need to soon. <laughs> if you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at rowanandpinepod. The and is spelled out at gmail.com you can also catch us on instagram at rowan and pine we are on youtube if you search for rowan and pine podcast same as if you search on facebook i think that's it smoke signals rate and review smash that like button give Hit us the some star. stars tell your friend tag us on instagram tell us everything you can dm us on instagram send I us some like... pictures of your cats yeah if We'd you like want that. us and if you want us to share your photos we could maybe have like little features like this is listener so-and-so's cat. <laughs> yeah. Um, Elaine, when you're listening, I would like some pictures of Katsu and Ramen, please. I was going to say, if you want us to post your cat pictures, it also comes with a $5 fee. <laughs> 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 I'm just kidding. It doesn't come with a fee. <laughs> You'll be doing us a favor, to be honest. <laughs> so we have stuff to post. <laughs> yeah. We need content, bro. So yeah, we're going to try and get a few episodes recorded ahead of time because Emily's going to have some very much needed time off coming up. And it's also, I don't think I said it to you, but it's actually going to be the same, around the same time as my honeymoon is booked for. So yeah, uh, that works out well. <laughs> and it'll be coming up. It'll be close to when we released our first episode, I believe. So wow. it'll be a nice time to just like, take a little break it could be our end of season one because i like the idea of having seasons for no yeah. reason at all <laughs> <laughs> and here's another season <laughs> yeah we'll not be gone for long hopefully um yeah, hopefully. and it'll give everybody time to catch up who hasn't already so for sure i have been neve and i'm emily and fuck, fuck yeah folklore. folklore this was rowan and pine <laughs> thanks for listening <laughs> Thanks for listening. Catch you in two weeks. Have a beautiful day. <laughs> <laughs> Meow.
Say hey to the podcast. It's gonna purr. Very nice.